now we have uh, John Saunders from uh, Royal Holloway University of London uh, to tell us about topological superfluid helium-3 under mesoscopic confinement. John, go ahead. Well, morning, everybody, and uh, thanks very much for the invitation. Um, as you may know, um, this year is the 50th anniversary of the discovery of superfluid helium-3, so it's what you call a uh, mature uh, subject. Um, but uh, what I'd like to talk um, about today is experiments on uh, maybe a new uh, direction where we combine uh, the technology of ultra low temperatures that you need to cool into the superfluid phases with nanofabrication technology, um, thereby studying the superfluid under mesoscopic uh, confinement. And I'll try and argue that this is a model system uh, for understanding topological superconductivity. And uh, to my knowledge, there are no um, firmly um, identified systems that can be classed as topological crystalline superconductors, although there are many candidates, a bit like quantum spin liquids, really, I suppose. Um, so um, first up, I'd like to acknowledge the three people underlined here who are full time in the lab um, and are instrumental in getting these experiments done, getting the nanofabrication um, done and a lot of work on the analysis. So this work is really due to them. Um, Angad Singh, who's um, just departed recently to uh, Oxford, um, contributed to the nanofabrication. Um, Andrew Casey is involved quite a lot in hands-on stuff in the, in the lab as well. Um, Priya Sharma um, is an expert on quasi-classical theory and is local, so that's very handy. Um, and we rely on uh, uh, superconducting devices, particularly squids from PTB. There are complementary experiments going on in GVAC Papia's group at Cornell. And Anton Bronsov has helped us with the, with, with the theory. Um, we also have a bunch of theory project partners, uh, particularly uh, I'd highlight uh, Jim Souls and Takeshi Mizushima, Mizushima, excuse me. Um, and we're supported by uh, EPSRC and the European, European Microcalvin platform. And I'll say a little bit more about um, the EMP uh, tomorrow. Um, so this is a rough outline of the talk then. As I said, um, the contention is that this system is a benchmark for topological superconductivity. So I'm going to talk about the effects of confinement on the order parameter. Um, and that actually just leads to this notion that the material phases of helium-3 can be tuned by engineered confinement. Um, so I think it's worthwhile thinking about uh, superfluid helium-3 as a quantum material, the state of which actually can be uh, manipulated. <clears throat> uh, so the two well-known phases are uh, the chiral A phase and uh, the B phase, which is time reversal invariant, the relative stability of those can be manipulated by confinement, as I'll show in a minute. Um, and of particular interest is moving towards a quasi two dimensional uh, chiral, chiral phase. So I'll give some results on that. Um, clearly, another aspect of interest, and it's intertwined with the um, the stability of these various phases is what are the surface states. Um, the beauty of superfluid helium-3 as a system is that it's a liquid, so you can pour it into these different shapes, geometries, which is convenient. Um, but you can also uh, tune the, the surface scattering, uh, and I'll explain how that's done. And we also discovered actually that there's some magnetic scattering under the right circumstances going on, which seems to have some fairly uh, profound effects and may have implications for people who want to work with uh, Majorana zero modes um, at the surface of um, uh, uh, topological superconductors. Uh, 
And then I'll talk about um, faces that spontaneously emerge uh, under confinement and a report on the observation of a, of a pair density wave by NMR. So talking to Seamus Davis uh, recently, um, you'll see if you're here uh, on, on Friday that there's some possibility that uh, Eterbium rhodium 2 silicon 2 is a spin triplet superconductor and also might support a pair density wave. And Seamus was suggesting that this would be the first observation of a triplet pair density wave. Um, and I had to point out that uh, I think we've seen a triplet pair density wave in superfluid helium-3. And this has an interesting uh, structure and, uh, and topology. Um, then I'll talk about all the parameters of sculpture. I like to refer to it by engineer confinement, just pouring, as it were, superfluid helium-3 into these different shapes. <clears throat> and then uh, through the notion then that you can tune uh, the material phase of helium-3 by confinement, uh, then you can create hybrid uh, na nanostructures. Uh, with interfaces between different regions where the material phase of the helium-3 is, is different. So that's about uh, creating a, a clean interface in the material, um, j j just like um, um, the transistor uh, came about because of the recognition that you could uh, dope a crystal of silicon differently in different regions and thereby create uh, a very clean interface. It's those clean interfaces that lie at the heart of um, the semiconductor technology. Um, so if we can create very clean interfaces within the body of the helium-3 itself, uh, this might help us in understanding um, surface and interface states. Of course, the interface within the liquid is a softer interface than the interface between helium-3 and under wall. So there are uh, distinctions there. Um, and the other thing I'll mention up front, because I probably won't get to talk about it much, and because the theoretical work is as yet unpublished, but there's the notion uh, primarily from uh, Jim Souls and Takishi and Mizushima, um, that this system is great because it also has um, what nowadays the helium-3 community refers to as Anderson Higgs modes. I mean, so uh, th these are collective oscillations uh, of the order parameter, which are, which are gapped. So there's one at square root eight fifths delta and another one at square roots 12 fifths delta. So they gaps and uh, weakly uh, dispersing. Um, the character uh, of, of those modes is lightly changed under confinement, uh, but they also may couple to the surface excitation. So for example, the Majorana cone on the surface of superfluid helium 3P. So that's um, a sort of a degree of freedom that this system has. And there are many, there are many others which I don't have time to go into today. Um, uh, and before moving off this, what seems to be rather long introduction, sorry for that, uh, is the, um, I, I'd like to highlight other uses of superfluid helium 3. Um, so it can act as a quantum simulator of phase transitions in the early universe because we have a transition between the A and B phases and these have different, different symmetries. Um, so we're now working with um, theoretical astrophysicists on it, experiments to um, test that uh, because after all, at vast expense, um, th there are going to be projects to uh, detect such things using um, uh, gravitational waves and other means. Um, and the other project that my colleague Andrew Casey is leading on is um, to use helium-3 as a, a dark matter detector for theoretically motivated um, 
dark matter candidates, another set of candidates um, with mass around the proton mass. But there are probably other ways in which superfluid helium-3 can be used to detect more exotic because of the coherent nature of the, of the ground set to, 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 to detect um, more ex exotic uh, dark matter candidates. So there are a few ideas about that kicking around. Anyway, um, so just to review then, um, here are the two phases of uh, bulk superfluid helium-3. Uh, the chiral phase is an equal spin pairing uh, phase. So it just has up, up, and down down pairs uh, which condense uh, with their orbital angular momentum pointing in the same direction. Uh, and this state breaks time reversal symmetry. And then we have the B phase, which has all three components of the spin triplet that essentially fo forms in something related to a total angular momentum equals zero state and that's kind of at the root of why its gap is isotropic. Uh, it's time uh, reversal invariant and it breaks spin orbit relative symmetry. Um, so under confinement, what we have to think about is how at a wall, different components of the order parameter are suppressed. So you can see here, the components characterized by um, the Z component of their orbital angular momentum. Uh, so you see that uh, those with where that component is zero are always fully suppressed uh, at the wall. Um, if the, um, I'm gonna talk about the concept of specular and diffuse scattering. So if you have a uh, diffuse scattering, essentially um, uh, random uh, scattering by the wall, uh, then this component is, is fully, uh, fully suppressed. Uh, but the LZ plus or minus one components will, will survive. And since uh, those are the only components that are present in um, the, the A phase, if you have specular uh, boundary conditions, uh, then you can have a, the, a state where there's no suppression of any components of the gap at the wall. And that's going to be important as we move on. Um, and then uh, re related to the suppression of the gap at the surface and calculated within the same framework of quasi-classical theory, um, you have a spectrum of surface excitations which emerge through a bulk edge or bulk surface uh, correspondence of these two distinct uh, topological um, superfluids. Um, so that for the B phase um, with um, a specular surface, you have this uh, linearly dispersing cone of Majorana-like um, excitations with a Majorana um, mode at zero, zero energy. Um, so in the case of a specular surface, then the um, momentum in the plane of the wall is is well is well defined, and obviously. Um, so uh, there are some uh, measurements of uh, surface in transverse surface impedance, uh, which can, uh, after some analysis, can pick out the energy dependence of the de of, of the density of states, and you can see that evolving as an interest in, in an interesting way and an expected way. Uh, as you change the uh, surface scattering conditions. Um, so uh, those have been uh, uh, known since the very, very uh, uh, early days, I think. Um, people like Amber Gerke, De Gen and, and, and Reina uh, back in the day, but the uh, um, the significance of um, of, of superfluid um, helium three as in as it were the periodic table of topological quantum matter was recognised very early on in the in the papers by Bolovic. Uh, 
And so that there are a, a, a lot of uh, that theoretical work actually uh, precedes um, stuff that was happening uh, when it, exactly these, yeah. These right I think so, yeah. I mean, the, yeah. Well, I don't think the word bulk boundary correspondence was used until around the time of bulk work of the right? yeah. So, yeah, well, I, okay. I, so, so I, yeah, I, 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 let me not get into a precedence, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. Anyway, I think it, it's, anyway. Yeah. Um, My question was about bulk boundary. Do people know what these things are? Yeah, I think it's pretty clear that they should that they that, that they should be there, uh, and so then the challenge comes to um, experimentally detect them right, and see the consequences of that. So, um, I want to say a little bit then about this business of um, um, adjusting the boundary condition. Um, so this is characterized by a specularity parameter. So here you see mirror-like uh, specular re reflections. Here you see a cartoon of diffuse reflections of a quasi-particle incident on a surface. And here you have the extreme case of uh, a retro reflection. Uh, so in this case, the specular case, there's no suppression of these components of the, uh, of the order parameter, which means that gap suppression and surface and draft bound states are eliminated for the A, of the A states, for the, for the A phase. But the chiral edge states uh, remain. Uh, and so that leads to uh, the existence of ground state uh, mass currents around the perimeter and various other consequences of these edge modes. In the case of diffuse scattering, then this random scattering, all components, the order parameter will be suppressed um, to a degree. And in the case of retro reflection, uh, you have maximal order parameter suppression and you get a pile up of zero energy and draft bound states. Um, and that's because the energy of the subgap uh, surface bound states is related through this equation, through the phase change that an incoming quasi-particle experiences uh, as it makes its reflection. So it sees a certain phase of the order parameter coming in and a certain phase going out. And the change in phase then is then related to uh, the energy of the, uh, of the surface in draft bound state. I'll come back to that later. So um, the, the key um, flexibility of this experimental system then is that we can, uh, in situ tune uh, the boundary condition, specularity. And we do this uh, by preferential absorption of helium-4 at the surface. So the surfaces that we're using, uh, here's the, the wall as it were, um, is a silicon surface. It's uh, smooth with atomic scale uh, roughness already. Um, and now we use the fact that um, because helium-4 uh, has a larger mass and hence smaller zero point energy. Uh, the, the binding energy to a, to a surface, the van der Waals potential of a, of, of a surface is higher for helium-4 than it is for helium-3. So the helium-4 preferentially goes to the surface. So in the natural case, then we have a liquid sample and uh, that van der Waals attraction to the surface gives rise to a few layers of solid helium at the wall. But if we add helium-4, we can replace that solid helium-3 uh, and eventually get to this state where we just have solid helium-4. Um, and that surface I'm going to show is diffusely, is diffusely scattering. So that's one important thing about it. Uh, and the other important thing about it is that we've eliminated the solid helium-3 by going from here to here at the surface. Um, and uh, that solid helium-3 is magnetic. Uh, so we've eliminated magnetic scattering at the surface by going from here to here. Uh, then if we want to make a fully specular surface, then we have to get to the point where we have a two-dimensional superfluid helium-4 film that would exhibit a coslet cellless transition on that, on that surface. And then we can create um, fully specular uh, conditions. And I'll demonstrate that that works in the, in the data. 
Um, so here's a cartoon of um, uh, the first confinement cells that we made. So you nanofabricate a, a cavity in silicon and then you bond uh, a smooth flat uh, glass uh, slide on, on top. And uh, what's shown here then is the um, are quasi classical calculations of the um, of the order parameter or the, the, the different components of, of, of the gap as characterized here for A phase and here for uh, B phase um, as a function of position in a cavity um, of uh, spacing height, um, a, a few coherence lengths as, as shown here. Um, so this shows um, the uh, if you look at the solids, the solid lines, then uh, there's no suppression uh, for A phase, uh, for B phase, there's no suppression of the components with um, or, orbital angular momentum perpendicular to the wall. Uh, but when the orbital angular momentum is parallel to the surface, those components are, 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 are suppressed. And in the case of the, the dashed lines are for uh, diffuse boundary conditions. So all of the components are suppressed approaching the wall. Um, so clearly, uh, practically, we need to make a cavity of, of fixed height. But what matters is the ratio of the cavity height to the coherence length. And here we can use the fact that um, we can tune the pressure of this liquid and the coherence length that um, is determined by these material parameters. And it varies from about 80 nanometers at zero pressure to something less than 20 nanometers at the melting pressure. So for a fixed cavity height, uh, we can tune the effective uh, confinement. Um, and so what that leads to then is uh, here's the here's the bulk phase diagram, and here's what the phase diagram uh, looks like for diffuse surface scattering uh, for different cavity heights, 1.1, 0.7, and 0.2. So you can see that the relative stability of the uh, of the a and b phase is changed by confinement because of the different effect that confinement has on the suppression of the gap at the surface um you can see um that in the case of confinement we have um a suppression of uh, of uh, a small suppression of tc here um a larger suppression of tc here and an even larger suppression of the critical temperature here. Um, and the regions of phase space in, in the pressure temperature plane occupied by the A phase and the B phase are profoundly affected by the confinement to the extent that uh, for a 0.2 uh, micron height cavity, um, we just see the A phase and we're using NMR uh, to fingerprint um, the, the order parameter. We can precisely determine what the order parameter is by nuclear magnetic resonance. And I'll elaborate on that um, as we go on. So I, what I want to do is I want to highlight this result here and talk about um, the interesting question of stabilizing the chiral A phase into the quasi two-dimensional limit. So on the left, you see the phase diagram that was determined um, for both uh, 192 nanometer high cavity and an 80 nanometer high cavity with specular surfaces. Um, so there is no TC suppression. And we see the A phase over the entire phase diagram, um, as opposed to uh, this narrow uh, section of A phase uh, at high pressures um, in the case of bulk. So this is the A phase order parameter, uh, um, which is uh, has the Y11 symmetry. Uh, with a node in the gap uh, along this direction. And the orbital angular momentum in the, in the cavities is oriented perpendicular to the, to the surface. Um, so even though you can't resolve the TC suppression uh, in the left-hand picture, um, there is a small TC suppression, and we can analyze that in two ways. 
um, so the TC suppression is then given by the effective specularity of the surface. So this small suppression uh, tells us that we have a specularity of about 0.98, which is very, very close to one. And then we get a self-consistent uh, self uh, measurement of the, uh, of the gap, which I'll show you uh, moment, momentarily. Um, so um, there was a question from some experiments done many years ago as to the relative stability of the axial phase, the chiral phase, and the planar phase, uh, which are degenerate in the, in the weak coupling limit. And the relative stability of, of phases in superfluid helium-3 depends importantly on uh, strong coupling um, corrections, which can in principle be determined um, exper experimentally. Um, so this plot um, shows uh, phase stability as a function of pressure with a particular set of uh, beta parameters. Betas are the coefficients of the um, of, of the fourth order invariance of the, um, of the of the triplet order parameter. As I said, they can be determined, or attempts can be made to determine them experimentally. Um, so there's a crossing in the stability of the um, B phase and the A phase at this high pressure, the, poly, the, the polycritical point. And what this plot uh, sh shows then is that um, even at zero pressure, um, th there are some uh, strong coupling corrections which stabilize the A phase relative to the, uh, to, to the, to the planar phase. Um, but it was important to actually uh, check that. Um, so I'll just quickly uh, give some, uh, since this is an experimental talk, um, some uh, technical um, some technical details. Um, so the helium three is confined in this uh, in, in this cavity. Uh, we assay it by NMR, um, and we utilize the fact that the conductivity of helium three is extremely high. So we can call it through this fill line to a heat exchanger, which is mounted onto the cold plate of a nuclear demagnetization cryostat. And here's a picture of a typical uh, cavity uh, where we also have uh, larger regions uh, of effectively bulk liquid to just make sure that we don't have significant temperature gradients uh, across the slab. So we can determine where the, uh, if, we, if we want to determine the suppression of uh, the transition temperature in the slab, uh, then we need to measure it in the slab and we need to measure it in bulk liquid at the same time and the same temperature in order to precisely determine TC suppression. Well, yeah. Just to ask the question to get questions going. Um, uh, you mentioned that helium 3 has a very high thermal conductivity. How does it actually compare with the thermal conductivity of helium 4 at the same temperature? Very favorably. I mean, uh, so the thermal conductivity of helium 4 is extremely small because uh, there's no thermal counterflow. Uh, and there are no um, excitations to, 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 to carry the heat. Uh, whereas helium-3 is a Fermi system. Um, and, and so um, that, uh, because of uh, the, 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 the Pauli limiting of, uh, of scattering of the, uh, of, of, the, of the Fermi surface, uh, then the mean free path goes as one over temperature. So, one over temperature squared. So that gives you a thermal conductivity that actually goes as one over temperature. So it's as good as copper at uh, one millikelvin. So here are some NMR signatures, and this is to show that um, the TC suppression, uh, so this is specular, no TC suppression. This is diffuse with some TC suppression. It's consistent with the suppression of the gap. So his, this is the gap under specular boundary conditions. And this is the gap with diffuse boundary conditions. So there's internal consistency of TC suppression and gap, and gap suppression. Um, that, I'll skip on from that. Um, so now um, what we really want to do um, going, going forward then is to stabilize a, a gapless uh, PX plus IPY uh, superfluid. Uh, so that would be a 2D chiral phase with a, with a uniform gap. Um, and in order to do that, we have to stabilize the chiral phase 
um, in slabs of thickness less than the coherence length. Um, and that's only going to be possible with specular surfaces because then you have no gap suppression at the surface. And this is now already achieved. Um, so the quasi 2D state then relies on size quantization in the normal state. Um, so because of size quantization, um, the, the, com the uh, component of the momentum uh, normal to the uh, surface is quantized, particle in the box effect. So the spherical Fermi surface is now uh, broken up into a set of Fermi disks. And there are predictions by Volovic uh, of analogs to the quantum Hall effect from that set of Fermi disks. So you can think of that as analogous to the de Haas van Elphen effect, if you like, where the Fermi disks are kind of like the Landau levels, but now uh, generated by a um, finite size confinement rather than the magnetic field. I'm just going to show you that in the, on the next slide. Um, so um, this is also interesting because uh, if you've got an ensemble of, of two-dimensional systems, um, it's, um, it's not clear how the pairing is going to work. I mean, so the relative stability of the A phase and the B phase is strongly influenced by pairing by spin fluctuations. Um, as um, Sauls has recently emphasized, you need to worry about not only ferromagnetic uh, spin fluctuations, but also anti-ferromagnetic spin fluctuations. Intuitively, you know that there should be anti-ferromagnetic spin fluctuations because at high pressures, there's something akin to a Mott transition driven by pressure uh, when helium-3 solidifies. And when it solidifies, it does so into an anti-ferromagnetic ground state. So associated with that Mott transition, then there are increasingly anti-ferromagnetic uh, spin fluctuations. And this relative competition between ferromagnetic and anti-ferromagnetic spin fluctuations is probably, uh, is certainly important in superfluid helium-3, probably important in any spin triplet superconductor, probably important uh, in the terbium rhodium-2, silicon-2, as uh, we'll see on... Uh, Um, I, I'm not sure you should, I, I'm not going to comment, comment on that, but they are both playing a, a role. The, 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 the fact that the, the traditional discussion, I mean, if you look at the Leggett review back in the day, if the, and the initial idea was from Anderson, actually, of the stability of the A phase being uh, driven by ferromagnetic spin flux, that it was being driven by ferromagnetic spin fluctuations. Uh, the role of the anti-ferromagnetic spin fluctuations is a relatively recent thing in order to fix up the details of the, uh, 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 how can you predict precisely what the phase diagram uh, um, uh, looks like. Um, the other thing actually uh, about two dimensions is, is that it's going to require a new treatment of surface scattering. If I've got an ensemble of two-dimensional systems, then thinking about a quasi-particle coming into a surface and reflecting off that surface clearly doesn't work if, uh, if all my systems are quasi-two-dimensional. Two and we've already seen evidence of that um, in, in experiments, and Priya Sharma has done a theory on that. Um, and now it's very interesting because you have Sorry, I don't have a picture for this, but if you imagine the top surface and the bottom surface, they have um, roughness at some on, on some length scale. Um, and it was shown a number of years ago in work by Tsanovich and also parallel work by Trevedi uh, that you can then um, calculate, if you know what the surface roughness is, you can determine what the effective disorder potential is. Um, so it's a, it's a fascinating system in which uh, you have pure helium-3, which intrinsically has no disorder, but you put it in contact with the, in a slab uh, between two uh, rough surfaces, <clears throat> and then you have an in-plane disorder potential, 
which is determined by the surface roughness, which is a measurable quantity, which I think is pretty, uh, pretty unique. So this is the answer uh, to Nigel's uh, 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 question then. Um, then here's the stuff about size quantization. This is the number of, uh, of disks. Um, so you, let's suppose you have a situation when there's a disk about to pop in uh, at the node of the gap. Uh, and then on the next level, which is the J naught minus one disk, what is the gap on that disk? So that's the smallest gap that you have. Uh, and interestingly, you see that it scales as one over the square root of the number of disks. So that's helping us, all right? So even with 100 disks, uh, the smallest gap is uh, about a sixth of the uh, maximum value of the gap. So that's accessible uh, by if you've got the ability to go to temperatures down to a few hundred microkelvin, then that is accessible. So we are so we already have a measurement on um, eighty nanometers. So now what you have to find is uh, a, a probe that's sensitive uh, to that, and that's probably uh, thermal transport, which I'll say more about later. Unfortunately, we can't measure the electrical conductivity of helium-3. Um, so this is to show then um, that, um, um, whoops, oh dear, now what have I done? Um, yeah. Um, so this is to show, um, this is again, TC suppression, as a function of effective uh, confinement. So we have a fixed cavity spacing, but we're tuning the pressure and hence tuning the coherence length. So that's how we're tuning the pressure and here's how we're tuning the coherence length. Um, so this is spec specular scattering, no TC suppression. This is close to diffuse scattering. And now when we have uh, no helium-4 pre-plating, so we have helium-3 on the surface, we have a stronger uh, than uh, diffuse suppression of the uh, of of TC. So quasi-classical theory calculates gap suppression, TC suppression in the spectrum of surface bound states in a in a self uh, consistent way. Um, so how do we understand uh, this TC suppression? Well, phenomenologically, uh, we can say, well, let's suppose the momentum scattering. Uh, was partially retro-reflective. So fully retro-reflective would be minus one. If we put in minus 0 0.4, then that can explain this TC suppression. But that's not uh, uh, physically plausible that that should be the case. Um, so we know that with helium-3 on the surface, uh, we're going to have the potential of uh, magnetic scattering. So we need to take that into, need to take that into, into account. Uh, so let's talk about magnetic scattering at, at the surface then. Um, so this was considered by, uh, by Anton uh, Borontsov. Um, and the picture that he came up with is that uh, what you need um, is um, spin flip. It's essential that you have spin flip exchange scattering uh, between the incoming quasi particle and the surface spins. Um, so it's realistic to say uh, that under the conditions that we've been measuring, uh, the helium-3 solid spins are essentially, uh, they're, they're, they're paramagnetic, so they're relatively um, disordered, weakly paramagnetic. Um, so a spin coming in then can either uh, flip or not have a mutual spin flip with, uh, with one of the, with the solid spins. So this adds an additional term and the spin, this spin flip scattering mixes singlet and triplet scattering, scattering channels. Um, so if you have a surface, which as far as momentum scattering is perfectly uh, specular, um, as you tune uh, the strength of this exchange interaction, you can take the effective uh, specularity across the whole range from plus one uh, to minus one. So if you have, so over here on this side, we have relatively strong spin flip scattering, and that can give you, uh, even for a, a specular 
surface an effective specularity from spin flip scattering of minus one. So it looks uh, retro reflective. So um, if the surface was diffusely scattering, uh, if the surface exhibited um, diffuse momentum scattering, there would be no effects. So you have to have an effective spec a momentum specularity of non-zero for this to for this to work. So this is what seems to be seems to be happening. Um, and uh, um, then as you, if we look at the, um, the density of states of excitations, uh, you can see that in the case of uh, specular scattering, um, the uh, density of uh, excitations is uh, the same at the surface as it, is, as it is in the bulk, and that reflects the nodes in the, nodes in the gap. Uh, but as you make uh, the surface uh, more, uh, as you reduce the specularity from one, then you get a pile up of uh, zero energy uh, bound states at the surface, and this is what we seem to be seem to be seeing. Then that's a consequence of uh, the observed uh, effective specularity uh, due to magnetic um, scattering. Um, so the significance of this is then that if you have surfaces with magnetic scattering, you're going to have a pile up of uh, zero energy or low energy uh, surface and drive bound states, and they're going to corrupt any Majorana zero modes uh, that you may be interested in on the surface for topological quantum computing applications. So this potentially is of significance to that, that community. Um, so there are a number of open questions around uh, around uh, magnetic uh, magnetic scattering. Uh, uh, probably the most important of which is, uh, as yet unanswered, um, how does magnetic surface scattering affect the surface states? These Majorana-like cone of uh, surface modes uh, that's predicted for helium three helium three b. Um, and that's going to be important for future studies of the dynamics of those um, surface excitations. Um, so now I want to um, move on to talking about uh, emergent, both emergent and engineered phases of superfluid helium three under confinement. Um, so the emerging phase that I'm going to discuss is the uh, pair uh, density wave. Uh, and discuss the fact that what was predicted was a one-dimensional pair density wave and what's observed is a two-dimensional pair density wave. Uh, and we can detect this by, uh, by NMR. And then after that, move on to the notion of order, order parameter sculpture and um, using uh, confining, geometry, confining geometries to stabilize new phases, that is, and thereby make hybrid um, Superfluid helium three devices. Um, so uh, the stability of um, a, uh, a a striped phase was predicted. I'm sorry, I don't seem to have the reference here by uh, Voronsov and Sauls. So this is the B phase. Uh, so I'm neglecting the um, dipolar interaction, which rotates the spin coordinates with respect to the um, orbital orbital coordinates. Um, so this is the diagonal matrix of the uh, of the B phase, and here is another degenerate phase in, in which I flipped the sign of this planar uh, component um, delta 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 perp. Sorry, sorry, non-planar component delta delta perp. So if this component here was zero, then it would be the planar phase. Um, so I flipped the sign of this component going across uh, the the domain wall. And what Bronsoff and Shaw Sauls showed is that um, this domain wall can spontaneously appear because it has a negative uh, surface energy because of the effect of the domain wall on, um, on pair breaking. So you have uh, here, here you have surface scattering with a particular change in phase of the, of the order parameter of the scattering event. But here, once you introduce the domain wall, you have other trajectories with different changes in, in phase. And so the overall pair breaking that results here uh, can be effectively reduced and stabilize the, uh, the, the, the domain wall. So this is 
Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, so this um, uh, is the uh, prediction then uh, in um, the, these uh, the, these coordinates. This is this is just to give you the flavour. Then this is the um, this is the A B transition that we uh, that we observe. So uh, the, the uh, vertical coordinate here is the, um, the the reduced thickness at which the transition occurs. So that's the actual thickness of the slab divide, divided by the coherence length, which is temperature and pressure de pressure dependent. So the AB transition then occurs across uh, this line. Um, and this is the range over which Voronsov and Sauls predicted um, that um, the stripe phase would be uh, stable. So it's in the vicinity of the, of the AB, um, AB transition. Um, we already have uh, evidence uh, from, from this plot that strong coupling effects are important all the way down to zero pressure because um, this is the uh, measured value of the AB transition in these coordinates. And this is the predicted value in uh, weak coupling theory. So uh, there are no strong coupling corrections. So um, the transition in these coordinates happens at a fixed value of D over the coherence length. And at zero pressure, the value is much lower than uh, what we see in the experiments. So this discrepancy is telling you that strong coupling effects are, are, are important. So then that opens the question as to what the um, effect of strong coupling is on the stability of the stripe phase. This is the weak coupling prediction. So let's see. Um, so uh, Wyman and Sauls uh, uh, did a Ginsburg-Landau theory in which they included strong coupling corrections. And now the stability of the stripe phase is uh, restricted to this narrow, this narrow corner. Uh, so that motivated, um, so strong coupling then, this is the bottom line, uh, significantly reduces the regional stability of the stripe phase, pair density wave. So this motivated us then to do an experiment at, uh, at, at zero pressure. Um, so here's some technical details that I'll probably want to, to, to skip over, but just give a flavor of it. Um, when you do NMR on superfluid helium-3, um, you're manipulating the helium-3 spins which are degrees of freedom of the, of the Cooper pairs. And that's what gives rise to, um, um, as, you, as you tip the helium-3 spins, then uh, the restoring force includes the change that you've made to the dipolar, into the coherent dipolar interaction. This was Leggett's prediction 50 years ago. Um, and hence you have a significant frequency shift of the NMR line due to that nuclear coherent nuclear dipole interaction, uh, which is fingerprints precisely what the superfluid state is. Um, <clears throat> so now uh, what we have under confinement is here's the cartoon then uh, that we have different components of the order parameter which are going to be suppressed in, in, in different ways. This can be calculated by quasi-classical theory. What about measuring it? Uh, well, you can construct um, these various averages of the order parameter over the cavity. And because the characteristic length scale that NMR probes is something called the dipolar coherence length, which is or the dipole length, I should say, which is about 10, 10 microns. In NMR, we're always averaging over the, the cavity. We're averaging across the cavity and we're averaging along the cavity on a length scale of about 10 microns. So the point then is, is that the NMR can in principle determine these averages. Now, uh, in the... Uh, in, in the striped phase, as we saw a second ago, if you remember, uh, what happens as you move across the domain wall is that this component delta perp actually uh, changes, uh, changes, changes sign. 
Um, so because it changes sign, then the average value of little q is going to be zero. Uh, so you can clearly distinguish then between uniform B phase and stripe phase through the different values of the this uh, of this average. Um, so this is what we're we're looking for. It's <clears throat> a little bit more involved uh, than 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 that. Um, we have to do. Um, so when we call from the A phase uh, to, to, to the B phase, we can form the B phase in one of, uh, of two states. And the simplest way of thinking about that. Well, if you, yeah. so you average over the whole two dimensional plane, right? So you average, you're, you're, you're averaging over a length scale of, 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 10, of 10 microns. In X and Y, right? So in, in X and Y. So and you can then say, uh, from that, you can conclude that it's modulated in both directions, x and y. No, it does. It's well, is it unit. So how do you? You said it's two-dimensional. Yeah. And not unidirectional modulation. Yeah, bit, 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 Yeah, I. Yeah. So I'm going to explain that. So, uh, for um, uh, um. For the uh, um, the the one-dimensional pair density wave, the average value of this quantity is zero. Okay, for the two-dimensional, it's non-zero. That's that's where it comes from. I'll show that in a in a second. Yeah. Um, so what are these two versions of the B phase? So the simplest way to understand it is um, if you apply a magnetic field to the B phase, then you break time reversal invariance. So you induce an orbital angular momentum. So you could you, you ask the question, what is the orbital angular momentum vector of the of, of the B phase? And that can either point up or down. And those two states have got um, a um, um, different uh, dipole dipole energy. So the uh, the condensation energy is the same, uh, but the dipole energy, which is a weak effect, is, is, is different. So there are circumstances that this state here has got the, uh, minimizes the dipole energy. This state here is, is, is metastable. If you cool down, you randomly get some combination of this state and this state. You can do a field cycling experiment. So you can go to low magnetic fields, in which case you can um, engineer a, a case where you have all of this metastable phase. And interestingly, uh, picking up on something that Ashley said, then uh, the domain wall, so suppose you've got in the slab, don't have, sorry, I don't have a picture of this, but suppose in the, in the slab, you have a coexistence of, uh, of these two phases, B sharp and, uh, and, and B flat. Uh, the domain wall between those is a soft domain wall because it's got to do with differences in the dipole energy. So the length scale is about 10 microns. Um, and uh, at the uh, wh where that domain wall uh, hits the surface, because of this domain wall, you're going to have uh, bound states in that, uh, in, in that domain wall. And uh, according to Volovic, then, where the domain wall intersects with the boundary, there you will have a Majorana, a Majorana state. So it's got some resonance, I think, with the notion of, uh, of, of defects uh, at a boundary giving rise to new kinds of uh, bound state. Um, anyway, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna measure the tipping angle dependence of, the, uh, of, these, of these frequency shifts. Um, this is where it's all described. Um, I won't go into the gory detail, uh, but we need to have these two versions, as it were, of the B phase with L up and L down to extract then uh, the, the, uh, the two parameters, uh, small Q bar and uh, large, Q, large Q bar, which give you these, give you these, the, these averages. Um, and when we do that, then uh, we find that, um, that small q bar is finite. Um, so the value of q bar that you would get then is uh, if, if you have a sort of a modulation like this is, 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 is given by effectively, uh, it's the, it's, it's the, the, relative, uh, the relative area occupied by plus and minus, which is um, different from 
a half uh, when you have a two dimensional structure, but it's exactly equal to a half if you have a one dimensional structure. And um, the, the, the distances between the, uh, the domain walls is on the order of the, um, the height of the slab. So it's about 10 coherence length. So that's also smaller uh, than the dipole length. So that's why we are averaging over many um, domains. So yeah, um, so here's the paper then. Um, so we believe we've seen the spin triplet um, pair density wave. Um, and uh, then we realized actually uh, that in the literature, there's lots of discussion about the relative stability of one dimensional and two dimensional uh, pair density waves. And uh, the question then is, why are we seeing a two dimensional pair density wave? So this is a, a, as yet unpublished work by uh, the, the, the Mizushima group um, in, in which uh, more detailed consideration of what happens to the components of the order parameter going across the domain wall is, is included. And what you see here are, uh, as it were, polar uh, components of the order parameter. So this is the polar phase. It's a pneumatic phase with a, with a, with a, with a, with a line node. And so since it's pneumatic, you can ask the question, what is the orientation of that, of that, uh, of, of that pneumatic phase? Um, so that's happening uh, at, the, at the domain walls. Um, and so you get, um, so you, if you think of that as, as it were as a pseudo uh, spin direction, some arrow, uh, the, the, uh, the real space uh, uh, topology of that is different for a one-dimensional domain wall and a two-dimensional uh, domain wall. Um, in fact, it has, uh, I believe, although I'm not sure, I believe it has a skirmion-like uh, character. So what that means is that the uh, domain wall of the, uh, of, of the, of the two-dimensional pair density wave uh, has, a, has this skirmion-like character that's coming from the polar, the polar component uh, the, and, and because of that, then it's topologically uh, stable. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the two dimensional pair density wave has a slightly higher energy than the one dimensional pair density wave for some reason or another, which we don't understand. We nucleate the two dimensional version, uh, but once it's nucleated, it's stable because of this topological uh, uh, effect. Um, so I need to skip on because I think I'm into discussion time. So um, just a little bit then about um, making hybrid structures. So this is an example of a hybrid structure uh, made in the 90s in uh, Chernogolovka by a current colleague, uh, Viktor uh, Petrushov. So he was a pioneer in hybrid metallic um, nanostructures and all the interesting physics that results from Andreev reflection between superconducting and normal pieces of this hybrid structure. Uh, so can we make analog um, structures from superfluid helium-3 uh, utilizing helium-3 based uh, materials where the material phase is determined by the confinement and other structures that we might nanofabricate within the slab-like uh, confinement. Um, so here is a theoretical paper on, um, on thermal transport across an NSNS uh, interface in a triplet uh, superconductor. And so you're gonna be um, sensitive in principle then uh, to the bound states that the SN interface uh, which are connected with the um, uh, mid-gap states that, that are going to form by the proximity effect in this normal normal junction. And uh, thermal transport across this thing is has an interesting uh, phase dependence. And so in principle, in ways that are not yet fully worked out, certainly by us, uh, you could access uh, Majorana zero modes uh, at that at that interface. 
that's the intuitive motivation for this for, for this work. So I'm talking about helium three based materials. So what are they? Uh, well, we've got we've already got chiral A phase and time reversal invariant B phase. We've got this spatially modulated state, but we also have new order parameters that are stabilized by order parameter sculpture. Um, so these are examples uh, of uh, the structures that we might wait, make. So here's an, or we have made. So here is an S and S in, in, interface. Um, so uh, here it is. Um, it, it, here, here is the CAD drawing of the nanofabricated structure. You can't actually see the very thin uh, normal region, at the, at normal junction, the normal bridge at the center of this structure. And these are probes for attaching uh, thermometers and heaters so we can probe thermal transport across these interfaces. Um, so we can measure longitudinal and transverse conductivity, transverse conductivity because that's an, uh, an analog of the Hall effect, the thermal Hall effect. Um, the Hall effect arises from diffuse surface scattering in the chiral phase. That's work by Priya Sharma and, and Sauls on, on that as yet unpublished. Um, to detect the Hall effect from the edge currents uh, and also to probe, as I said, the interface states. Um, and so putting a structure related to this on a cryostat which can rotate and so easily generate the phase difference between the two pieces of superconductor that's possible within the European microcarbon platform because there's a rotating superfluid helium-3 cryostat in Helsinki. And the other thing to draw attention to to distinguish superfluid helium-3 from superconductors is this thing um, that's related to the question that Piers asked about the high thermal conductivity. The, the, the inelastic mean free path of helium-3 at low temperatures is 50 microns. Uh, and so you can make relatively long junctions uh, in which the quasi-particle transport is ballistic. And that's not possible in in superconductors. Um, so there are other hybrid structures that you can make uh, for creating isolated mesas of superfluid helium-3 to understand the nucleation of the B phase from the A phase with this cosmological um, application. Um, these are predictions by Weimann and Sauls uh, about now if within the uh, um, the, the, the cavity, you make a, uh, an array of square posts, then you break rotational symmetry. And so you can generate uh, a phase that's analogous to the B phase, but with fourfold symmetry rather than continuous rotational symmetry. Um, if you make channels, um, the channels will also stabilize pair density waves of, of, of uh, chiral and polar um, within, within, within the channel. Um, you could even, in principle, make uh, periodic um, systems of, uh, of cavities coupled in this way. So you could refer to those as topological superfluid metamaterials. Um, so this is the inverse where you um, have uh, so solid posts, uh, which should sta stabilize uh, the polar phase, which has been already stabilized in helium-3, uh, into which aerogel has been uh, submerged and so breaking the um, breaking the symmetry and stabilizing the pneumatic phase namely the polar the, the polar phase um, so here are some future experimental um, uh, challenges then uh, because um, really the question of interest is okay guys um, but all very interesting what can you actually measure uh, going forward um, so uh, we can extend the NMR methods. So uh, broadband squid NMR means that you can do NMR at a series of different frequencies in order to study um, the case where we had a helium-3 surface boundary layer. We have to distinguish between the dipolar shifts that are happening within the solid layer as, it, as the polarization of the spins in that solid layer increase and the dipolar frequency shifts that are happening in the superfluid. And we can do that if we go down in frequency by uh, an order of magnitude. Uh, other applications of broadband screen NMR are being able to do NMR at the dipolar field, which is about 50 uh, millitesla. Um, so there are uh, uh, 
helium 3b has a topological transition uh, between a state in which uh, below that critical field um, you have uh, oriented in a particular way um, the Majorana cone has zero gap and above that critical field a gap appears um, and there's a paper by uh, Vishwanath and uh, colleagues in science that um, predicts a lot of exotic phenomena happening um, at that at that transition. Uh, we, we're, we're working on doing local NMR with microcoils. So the idea is to do NMR on um, one region of the surface uh, and or to put a pulse on one region of the surface and look at the response somewhere else to see if we can see long range entanglement that's uh, driven by non-local response of these uh, Majorana-like uh, surface, surface states. I've shown you a cell in which we're developing local thermometry for thermal transport. So that will be a way of studying the dynamics of, um, of surface states, detecting edge currents and analogs of the quantum Hall effect and detecting these interface states. Uh, we have to figure out a way to detect uh, ground state surface spin currents, which are predicted in the, um, in, in, in the B phase. I spoke a bit about the beginning about coupling between Anderson Higgs modes. Uh, so bosonic excitations of the superfluid with the surface excitations. Um, we spoke a little bit about um, progress to fully two-dimensional superfluid helium-3. Um, and then the question is, um, would you ever uh, be able to realize the possibility where topological superfluid helium-3 uh, with all the, the defects that it can support I haven't said anything about vortices in this system. We've spoken about um, domain walls, hard and soft, um, whether there's uh, uh, that or any other way of manipulating Majorana zero modes in order to uh, um, help support the development of topological quantum computation. Um, so there's my summary slide, and I think I'm kind of done with 10 minutes to spare, so yeah, that's your that, yeah. attention. And I apologies to the fact that uh, you are primarily um, an, uh, a theoretical audience, and uh, I have no pretensions to theoretical capability. So this has been an experimental talk, so my apologies. Time for questions. Yeah. Maybe I can ask a question. Uh, you mentioned that you mentioned that you might be able to detect spin currents on the surface of helium three B. Yet I thought that the surface states of helium three B were Majorana fermions and don't carry any spin. H how is that possible? Um, I think there is no net spin current. I, I think, as I understand it, then um, there's um, um, there's a helicity uh, to the to the modes. So if you have um, a quasi particle propagation on the surface in a particular direction, its um, spin is constrained to be uh, perpendicular uh, to, to the momentum. So I mm -hmm. think the net spin current uh, on the surface mm -hmm. uh, is, is zero, but I think you get uh, spin currents uh, around the edge of a, of a, of a confined, Combined sample. So the, the short answer to the question is, is we haven't worked out how to do that yet. Mm. Thank you. Other questions? Can I check if any online person have questions, please raise your hand or put in chat. So, the fragility of the surface states uh, to perturbations that break trifocal asymmetries. Or... Yeah, that's so. That comment there is referring back uh, to the work that was done when we had helium three on the surface. We observed a higher TC suppression. 
the higher TC suppression is consistent with there being um, a uh, increase in the density of surface bound states at zero energy. Um, so, um, so the word uh, fragility is intended to emphasize the fact then that, as I understand it, in topological insulators, uh, the surface bound states are robust against all sorts of uh, details of disorder at the, at the, on the surface. Uh, Can you think about them being robust against um, like disorders of the spec's symmetry projected in topological phase of the wall? Hmm. So like on the surface of a QPPI, do you need to think about the surface states being robust against non-magnetic disorder, which would not break Um, so, for instance, like some people have a lot of, or <laughs> they're kind of dismissive, basically, of like crystalline topological phases where the uh, topological phase is protected by some crystalline filters, or something, like a mirror or something, um, because they think it's uh, much easier, you know, for instance, to have some kind of disorder uh, that will break one of those crystalline filter symmetries as opposed to, say, the topology associated with, like, you know, a, a turn insulator. Or even like magnetic disorders should not remove the hedge points. Yeah, I mean, it's so fragility is, um, you know, it's one of those slightly emotive propaganda terms, really. I mean, uh, the more uh, sensitivity of the surface bound states, surface bound state spectrum to the precise boundary conditions. And the fact that uh, there could be magnetic scattering going on at the surface. So in a slide that I skipped, um, I'm not sure I want to go back to it, but I can try. Um, there's um, um, a contrast between, here it is. Um, um, surface scattering and point scattering. So there's a lot of work being done on immersing um, a, a, a silica aerogels into helium, right? Where the strand diameter is uh, much smaller than the coherence length. So you can think of those as point scatterers. Um, so experiment, whereas in our case, we have a pristine helium-3 with a surface. Surface, so the treatment of surface scattering and the treatment of point scattering is different. Um, and in the so here's the um, sort of Ginsburg-Landau expression for TC suppression for surface scattering, and you can see there's the length scale of the confinement, and there's the coherence length squared. Whereas for point scatterers, uh, it goes as the ratio of the coherence length linearly to the mean free path. Um, and that's seen uh, in experiments on um, superfluid helium-3 in um, uh, pneumatic aerogel, what's it called, NAFN. Uh, and it's also seen in, uh, here's, here's a result on uranium platinum-3. Um, and magnetic scattering from point scatterers is, I think, well known. And there's even a review by Bolatsky in RMP on, on that. And then there's a treatment of um, helium-3 in aerogel by, uh, by Minyev on that. Um, but in, uh, so, so what it was about was uh, applying this notion of spin-flip scattering to the, to the, to the surface case. I mean, there is other stuff on, oh, suppose you had a, a magnetic surface layer, uh, what would the effect of that be? And the answer is that can't give you what you want in the in, in the experiments. Um, and interestingly, in the experiments, because the magnetic layer is um, is this surface boundary layer of helium three. As you go down in temperature, there is a there is an exchange interaction uh, that's tending to make it go into a ferromagnetic state. It's rather small. Its characteristic energy scale is a few tenths of a millikelvin. But at very low temperatures, those spins will be aligned. Uh, so you'll make a transition 
from uh, this state here, where you need to have, as it were, the randomicity of paramagnetic spins to give you this effect, to this state here, where the surface spins are fully polarized and shouldn't have any effect. Um, so, it's, as it were, the, some sort of re-emergent effect um, might be detectable. But in order to see that, uh, you'd have to measure uh, not, not TC, because we're way below TC now, you'd have to measure the influence of that on the order parameter. And we can do that by NMR if we can disentangle the signal from the uh, solid from the signal from the superfluid. Super and that was the point of the broadband NMR. I gave a long answer to the question in case there weren't any others. Because it would be a bit embarrassing if we had to go to the pub early, wouldn't it? No, we're just on time. We're on time. We're on there you are. Perfect. Yeah, okay. Let's, let's well, thank, yeah. Thanks, John, for a great talk. Uh, Even theorists can understand something. So we'll be resuming at uh, 2.30 with Nigel Hussey's talk, and John will be giving another talk on a completely different topic. Tomorrow. It's Herbie and Radium no, yeah. Friday. It's Herbie and Radium Tuesday. Tomorrow, tomorrow's Friday. Tomorrow's Friday. What? Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs>